So yes, yeah, so we're very glad to have Professor Greg Kickerson here today with us. Uh, so uh, Greg got his PhD in Caltech in 1992, and then he joined uh, Hopkins. Uh, he got, became a full professor there in 2001, and uh, became a chair for some time as well. Uh, and he has got, so his primary work is in uh, robotics, and recently he has been also looking at some biological applications. Uh, because, you know, in earlier work, that uh, some of the work that I kind of followed was in hyper random robots, you know, for uh, motion planning, and um, you know, going back to that and kind of using it in some of my work uh, recently. And uh, so he has got several uh, awards for his work as well. Uh, he was a uh, young investigator from National Bank Science Foundation that was kind of the earlier version of the career award. And he became the, the presidential faculty fellow also recently. Uh, and uh, he became the SME fellow in 2000. And I took the fellow uh, in 2010. He has also written two wonderful books, which is the family author of. And I hear something about that is going to happen today. <laughs> he mentioned to me earlier. Uh, new version of uh, second version of those books is coming out. A second part of that book is coming out. Uh, he mentioned this to me recently. In the near future. So today he's going to be talking about uh, stochastic model and robotic and structural biology. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to violate a rule that I tell my students. I usually tell them one slide per minute in a talk, and, but I have about 80 slides, so I'm going to try to go a little bit faster than normal. And I'm going to cover a lot of different topics. Some of them are older and some of them are newer, starting with snake-like robots and how that got me into modeling DNA statistical mechanics. Uh, then talk about class averaging in cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, some problems in x-ray crystallography, uh, and then we'll come back to robotics toward the end of the talk. And since time will be limited, I think I will acknowledge my collaborators up front. Um, all of this work has been done in collaboration with many, uh, many folks who are listed here, as well as uh, others. Um, so I started my career looking at snake-like robots. That's what my PhD work was on. Um, so this was a snake-like robot that I designed and built and implemented at Caltech. Um, and this, uh, this in Cyrillic, the CCCP, means the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So uh, that was supposed to be capturing a Soviet satellite from in outer space using snake-like robots back in you know, the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, when, uh, uh, when I was finishing my PhD. So this is, uh, uh, this is another application of snake robots, is uh, sort of uh, moving through highly constrained environments and obstacle avoidance. So uh, that was a long time ago. And these are also some simulations from a long time ago. To tell you how long ago that was, I actually used a video camera to capture the images from the computer screen, which have been now digitized and being <laughs> played here. So, um, the, the idea of using snake-like robots with a lot of articulation is that you can use caterpillar-like locomotion gates to manipulate objects while maintaining a firm grasp on them, as well as uh, doing problems like obstacle avoidance, whether the obstacles are moving or stationary. The first thing that I did when I started at Johns Hopkins almost 20 years ago was to learn from the, my PhD experience, which was if you make very complicated robots, then they're more prone to breaking down, and they're more expensive because you have many more actuators. So the first concept that I came up with at Johns Hopkins was the idea of what we call a binary manipulator. So if you imagine the same kind of robotic structure as in those videos, but where each leg, each uh, element of the truss structure, each, each stru strut, uh, can be actuated in a binary fashion, either completely extended, or in a retracted state, so a, a longer length, leg length or a shorter leg length. Uh, but we don't try to control them in the middle. So for example, if we use pneumatic actuators, which are difficult to control because of the compressibility of air, if we just try to use them in a, in a two-state fashion, then we can construct an arm with a finite set of states. In this case, I'm showing three binary actuators, one per uh, leg in the, the truss. Uh, and so we get a total of eight states for this robot arm. And we, this is, we invested a lot of effort into how do we design this, the, the stroke lengths so that the distribution of these points is 
uh, optimal in some sense, or that we design it to reach a particular set of positions and orientations. Um, and if we stack uh, these sorts of uh, truss elements on top of each other, we get this sort of uh, binary actuated uh, robot arms. Um, on the left side, what you see is a planar copy, where because it's binary actuated uh, and the workspace is a discrete set of reference frames, the idea is to use this in combination with a, a fixturing mechanism so that the arm or the hand basically gets close to where you want and then the fixture grabs onto it and then zeroes any error. And uh, so the idea is that using a, a very inexpensive robot arm together with fixturing in the environment gives you a cross between fixed automation and uh, very inexpensive robotic arms. And so um, the, the uh, analytical aspect of this is that if we take a robot arm uh, that has many of these binary states, then the workspace is a, a discrete cloud of reference frames. And so we describe this discrete cloud with a smoothed out continuous density, a workspace density. So this density is a function uh, of position and orientation. In other words, uh, it's a, uh, a probability density of where the end of the robot arm can reach. And we use this information in planning and doing inverse kinematics. Um, so just for a little bit of background, so we describe rigid body motions using homogeneous transformations. Here the capital A is the orientation or the rotation describing the orientation of the hand, and little a is the translation from the base to the end of the hand describing its position. And the workspace density is a function of this G. Um, and there's a whole calculus of rigid body motions, much like you have calculus in Euclidean space. We can take derivatives, we can integrate, etc. So this, is, this describes how to take essentially a directional derivative of functions of rigid body motion. Um, and similarly, we can integrate uh, with respect to, uh, there's a standard volume element with respect to integration uh, in the plane, it's dx, dy, d theta, which I've written here in polar coordinates for the position. Uh, in the three-dimensional case, uh, if you use Euler angles to describe rotations, there's a, a, a volume element which is sine beta, the alpha, d beta, d gamma, and then the translational element is just uh, the Lebesgue measure, dx, dy, d, d z. Um, so, okay, so we can, we suppose we have this workspace density, what do we do with it in the context of these binary robot arms? Well, these are serial structures um, which have constructed of modules stacked on top of each other. And so what we can imagine is that the base module uh, moves around the distal n minus 1 units. So the base module you can view as a transport device for the workspace density for the distal n minus 1 units. And in order to put the hand where we want it to be, what we do is we select that finite and small, from, from among that finite and small number of states at the base, we select the base state that puts the highest workspace density for the remaining part of the arm over the point that we want to reach. And then we freeze the base state. And then with that fix, we go up to the next one, and we do the same thing. And so what we do is, even though there are two to the n power states, sounds exponential and very hard, the serial nature of the arm allows us to go up the chain and solve the inverse kinematics uh, in linear time. So here's an example, and this is a very old example, it's almost 15 years old now, that my first student, uh, Ime Ibert Ophoff, did. Uh, here, green means very, very black, uh, basically, this arm has it have about 300 trillion states. Each leg is two back-to-back -back binary actuators, so each leg has four states. There are three legs per platform, and there are 16 platforms. So it's two to the 48th power, or about 300 trillion states. And here on the computer 15 years ago, which couldn't handle that number of states, and so it dumped green for black in the background, is doing the inverse kinematics in real time as we speak. And so, of course, it would be even faster today. Um, but that's using what we call this path of probability algorithm, which is the one that I just described. 
locally, always optimizing the, uh, the workspace density uh, based on the choices of, um, along the chain. And the base has the most influence of where the end will be, and that's why we start at the base. So then the question becomes, how do we generate this workspace density information? Because to, by brute force enumerating uh, 2 to the n power, where n is 48, or it could be even higher, uh, is an exponentially difficult problem. What we do is we cut, imagine cutting the arm into smaller pieces, each piece of which we can enumerate the states and fit a density to, and then we do a convolution of the densities of these pieces of the arm. And this convolution is a convolution over SE2 or SE3, the special Euclidean group of the plane or three-dimensional space. So, uh, and I liked the idea of convolution on groups so much that together with my former postdoc, we wrote this book back 10 years ago about essentially Fourier analysis on Lie groups and their engineering applications. Because once you start to pose problems as convolutions, the natural engineering tendency is to ask, how do we compute those? Is there an analog of the FFT, et cetera? And so we actually developed uh, some analogs of the FFT for uh, convolutions on the group of rigid body motions. Okay, fast forwarding a little bit in time, uh, one sort of instantiation of snake-like things that I've been involved with recently has been a coll collaborative project with my colleagues uh, Noah Cowan and former colleague Alison Okamura, who's now at Stanford, uh, and their joint student Bob Webster, looking at uh, kinematic needle steering. So in the needle steering problem, uh, there is no actuation in the needle. It's a passive needle, and it has a bevel tip, a slanted tip, and all the actuation is at the base. And there's only two things you can do at the base. You can push and you can twist. And if you push, then the bevel tip of the needle, because it's slanted, will cause this very flexible needle to veer in a, essentially a circular arc. And by twisting, we reorient the needle tip. So by pushing and twisting, we can go in one circular arc, followed by a circular arc in a different plane, followed by another one. And so this can be described by a kinematic model. Um, and this was uh, published in IJRR a few years back as a collaborative, collaborative effort uh, between all of us. Um, and this is the first case where stochasticity in my talk is entering today, because if you do the experiment a hundred times, you're going to get a hundred slightly different circular arcs. And so uh, one way to model that is as a noise process. So the equation for the circular arc would be uh, what you see here with the dw's set equal to zero. That would be a deterministic model of um, how basically the velocities, constant velocities, both angular and translational velocities, evolve for a circular arc with curvature kappa uh, and unit speed forward one. That's what the vector on the left indicates. But the vector on the right shows that there's some noise that enters through the heading um, and, uh, in, and in, the, in, in the pushing direction. And if we do that, we can generate an ensemble of trajectories. And corresponding to that ensemble, we get a workspace density at the end of the needle. And so we can use this path of probability algorithm again in exactly the same way that we did for the binary manipulator. So actually, the, this number four here is a relatively recent paper where my f former student, Uran Park, who's now an assistant professor at uh, UT Dallas, and my former student, Yunfeng Wang, who's an associate professor at the College of New Jersey, we worked out um, uh, how to do this path of probability algorithm for the needle steering problem. And the other ones are just sort of older references that set the, um, set the background. Okay, so now let's uh, switch gears, uh, and so, so what does that all have to do with statistical mechanics of DNA? Well, it's all actually the same problem, just recast in different settings. If I give you a DNA molecule, which is an elastic filament molecule, it has uh, resistance to bending and twisting and extension, it's like a chiral or helical elastic rod subjected to Brownian motion, okay? And folks in the DNA statistical mechanics world 
are interested in things like what is the probability that the two ends of the DNA are going to come together and meet so it forms a cyclic DNA. Uh, in fact, I was uh, out, uh, former uh, University of Maryland professor John Maddox from the math department here uh, is now at uh, EPFL in Switzerland and uh, I gave a talk on, he does DNA mechanics and uh, invited me out for a talk um, a couple of months ago actually. So um, there was a workshop on DNA statistical mechanics. So uh, this kind of model uh, is a Fokker-Planck equation model. So at the bottom of the screen is a, uh, it's a partial differential equation which is describing uh, the evolution of essentially workspace density. Okay, it's describing the evolution in position and orientation of the end as a function of arc length. And uh, the right side of this partial differential equation is the uh, diffusion operator that describes the evolution of this probability density. And so there are three parts to that diffusion operator. The DLK, those are the diffusion constants, which are essentially the inverse uh, the elements of the inverse of the stiffness matrix, the six-dimensional stiffness matrix that describes resistance to bending and extension and twisting uh, of two uh, adjacent uh, reference frames attached along the molecule and uh, weighted by uh, the, essentially the temperature. So the hotter things are, the more flexible things look. Um, and then the little d, it describes the referential uh, filament characteristics, so the helical uh, baseline nature of DNA. And then the last term, the, the X6, just says that we're moving s along the Z direction with a constant speed, which corresponds to an inextensible or arc length parameterized uh, model, which is very common in the DNA world because the, this amount of stretch is very, very small. So this kind of equation actually can be solved. Um, so here are explicitly what these operators look like. We don't need to go into that in too much detail. But these kind of equations uh, are essentially the analog of a PDE on Euclidean space where you have constant coefficients. And the way one would solve that is by just applying the Fourier transform. So what we do here is we apply the group Fourier transform. And just like there are operational properties of the usual Fourier transform, there are operational properties for this group Fourier transform. In other words, if we take the group Fourier transform and apply it to the convolution, we get a product of Fourier transforms of the individual functions. And if we take this Fourier transform and we apply it to one of these differential operators applied to the function, we get the Fourier transform of the original function multiplying some operator matrix in this generalized Fourier space. And so what we then have is a procedure for taking these sorts of Fokker-Planck equations, applying a group Fourier transform to it, it turns it into a system of linear ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients in this generalized Fourier space. The solution to that subject to delta initial conditions is simply the matrix exponential, and then we use the inverse Fourier transform to recover the, uh, the solution. So we have a, a fairly clean way of handling these problems, and we can also handle problems such as if the DNA has a bend in the middle, we can solve the diffusion equation up to the bend. The bend in the middle is like a delta function in SE3 um, in, in terms of position and orientation, uh, and so we convolve the solution up to here with a delta function and convolve it with the solution to the end. And all of this can be handled very nicely in the Fourier domain. So we end up publishing papers in like Macromolecules and Journal of Chemical Physics and uh, Physical Review E uh, on DNA statistical mechanics, essentially using the same tools as what we developed in the robotics context. So now I'm going to talk about another topic, which also uses this concept of Euclidean group convolution. Um, but it's not for articulated objects. This is for data obtained from cryo-electron microscopy. So in electron microscopy of macromolecular complexes, 
One generates a purified solution of these complexes, which could be viral capsids or ion channels or other relatively large uh, structures that are too large to crystallize, although components of them could be crystallized. The whole structure itself is generally too large to crystallize. So, and then a very thin layer of the solution is then flash frozen into a vitreous ice uh, and then uh, it's put into the electron microscope at which uh, basically does tomography on the, uh, the samples. And under the assumption that all of the copies of the complexes are the same, um, you get these projections and the problem is to reconstruct from the projections. Now this is actually a harder problem than in medical CT because for a couple of reasons. One is uh, that this is all 3D, whereas CT is planar slices. A second is when a patient is sitting in a CT scanner and the x-rays are taken, you, the algorithm knows from what directions the x-rays are taken. Okay? Here, these molecules were tumbling around by rotational Brownian motion before they were flash frozen into place. So there is no a priori knowledge of what their relative orientations are relative to the beam direction. And then the third thing is, this is a very noisy thing. Okay? If we look at uh, the pictures here on the left, uh, the signal to noise ratio is about 2%, 0.02. In other words, it's mostly noise. Okay? And so then how do you reconstruct when you don't know what the direction is and it's mostly noise? Well, there are methods for class averaging, okay? And so you might get 10,000 images, and they have to be classified into, say, 100 directions. So each one has 100 uh, samples in it. And then uh, these, these images in each class, which correspond, hopefully, well, you never know in advance, but hopefully they correspond to the same beam direction relative to the body frame of the complex being analyzed. Uh, then, by superposition, uh, because the, the noise is ergodic and uh, essentially Gaussian, um, uh, by superposition, the noise drops out. So if you have 0 0.02 uh, signal to noise ratio, and you have 100 images and you put them together, maybe you bump up to about 50% uh, signal to noise ratio, something like that. So this uh, image on the right shows a class average diversion of, uh, of, of many uh, raw images, such as those on the left. But then the question becomes, how do you do class averaging in a, uh, in a rational way? And so just to illustrate the problem, uh, if we had two pristine images uh, in the same class, uh, I mean, corresponding to the same um, beam direction relative to the body frame, and we calculate the center of mass and, say, moments of inertia of the projection. And if there were no noise, we could just put them right on top of each other. There would be no problem. Now, in the lower image, there's a little bit of noise. If, we, if you take that and then you try to calculate the center of mass and the moments of inertia, the noise corrupts that a little bit. And then if you try to superimpose them, the angle and the position is going to be slightly off. So what happens then, but the noise adds and, and disappears, essentially, or at least is reduced. And so this just illustrates that there's a trade-off between noise reduction and blurriness. Okay? So we reduce the noise, but we increase the blurriness of the image. Yes? How do you know that the noise disappears when you add it to Because it's ergodic. So here, if you add two, it doesn't completely disappear, but if you add a hundred images, uh, then because the noise in each pixel is Gaussian distributed it, with zero mean, it, it, it es essentially cancels. Um, now, but the reason why I'm interested in this is because uh, this can be formulated as a convolution over SE2, over the ri rigid body motions in the plane. So the reason being that if you add many, so uh, if you say uh, rho of x comma t, t is just an artificial time parameter that's indexing the many images. Um, and each image has a, is a perturbation on a baseline, rho sub zero. So rho sub zero is what we want to find, rho sub zero of x. 
But what we're actually looking at is rho sub zero shifted by some rigid body motion, g sub t, and added onto there is a noise field, okay? Uh, which is different for each image. Uh, but statistically, uh, we'll, we'll average to zero if we add them all together. So if we add these images all together, um, what we get actually is a, uh, a, a, a kernel which convolves against the quantity that we want to obtain. And so, uh, what, and, but we've, what we've done is we've actually characterized what that kernel looks like. In other words, we know what its mean and covariance are, and it's a Gaussian kernel in x, y, and theta, and so we came up with methods that how to deconvolve the effect of that blurring kernel. And so this just shows some of the results. The results on the left are using the state of the art uh, in, uh, in uh, cryo-electron microscopy, a program called EMAM, uh, and on the right is our deconvolved version. So you can see the sharpness is a little bit better uh, in what we've done. And if we look, if we take cross sections through the images, you can see that the black, which is ours, has higher highs and lower lows. Of course, if we just had higher highs, that would be like turning the gain up, right? I mean, that would be, you know, like uh, the movie, uh, this is Spinal Tap, you know, this is, you bring it up to 11, our, our, our amplifier goes up to 11 rather than to 10, it's just a rescaling. But we have uh, higher highs and lower lows. Um, and, okay, so in the process of doing this work, uh, because we had to do a lot of transformations on images, including rotating pixelized images, we actually came up with a new way, uh, a lossless way, to rotate pixelized images. And so this is sort of a, a side note to the general talk, but we came up with a way to expand images in Hermit function expansions, which, uh, the first of which is a Gaussian, the next of which looks like a derivative of a Gaussian, etc. And these functions have a, a nice property that if you expand in a two-dimensional Hermite function expansion in X and Y, uh, and have a certain band limit imposed on that, then you can show analytically that if you rotate the image, that also can be expanded in a, a, a Hermite function uh, series with the same band limit. In other words, you don't gain, you don't lose any information or gain any artifacts by uh, rotating uh, an image uh, expanded in this way. And so uh, here's an example where we start with an image and we rotate and we rotate back. If we had done interpolation, when you interpolate, uh, say, from pixels onto a rotated grid, uh, and then you rotate back, you actually don't get the same result you started with. That's a lossy process, whereas this is a lossless uh, rota image rotation process. And so some of the papers associated with the cryo-electron microscopy work and the associated imaging work that we've done are listed here. Okay, now I'm going to move on to another topic. So all of these topics are related either by stochasticity or by the mathematics of rigid body motions, uh, Fourier analysis on Lie groups, etc. Um, here's another problem where uh, articulated models, just like in robotics, are used uh, and can be used uh, in uh, macromolecular crystallography. So crystallography is the main workhorse for determining the structures of large biomolecules. Um, and so, the, uh, so for instance, the protein data bank now has around 80,000 different protein structures in it, and about 60,000 of those have been obtained from X-ray crystallography. Uh, the others being from nuclear magnetic resonance and other, other sources. So the steps are first you express your protein, usually in bacteria, by genetic engineering and you purify it and you grow a crystal and that crystal growth is usually done by robots. Uh, robots, uh, on, there, they, there are many uh, small cells on a plate that have different salt conditions and you never know exactly what salt conditions are going to crystallize a protein, so the robot's completely automated. The, uh, the robots basically put the sam protein samples in the different conditions, then uh, look and see what, uh, what crystallizes and what doesn't. So actually, my father is a biochemist at Georgetown University. He, his whole PhD back in the late 60s and early 70s was to crystallize one protein over five years. 
Now they can crystallize a protein in a couple of hours, uh, finding the right conditions using the robotics. Um, and so, um, uh, so after the crystal, uh, after the conditions are found and a crystal is, is obtained, that crystal is then taken to a synchrotron. X-ray uh, X-ray beams are shot at it, and then a diffraction pattern is obtained from that. And that diffraction pattern. Uh, tells you some information, but not all of the information, about the structure of the, the protein molecule. And that's where articulated models come in. So uh, let me show you, first of all, a little bit about the mathematics of crystallography. So this is a, a paper I wrote that appeared this year in Active Crystallographica A, which is sort of the fundamental uh, um, ACTA uh, journal um, in crystallography. There's A, B, C, D, E, F, I think. Uh, in active crystallographica, uh, D being the bio biological crystallography, A being mathematical and fundamental. So uh, imagine that the Q here represents a protein, okay? And this grid represents uh, a crystal. So it's actually, in, you can think of it as an ideal crystal as being infinite. So these little cells go on to infinity in all directions. Now, the Q uh, is never going to be sitting flat in the unit cell like that, okay? Uh, there's some rigid body motion that we need to determine as to where that Q is. Now, unlike rigid body motion in the plane, which has translations that can go on to infinity, if you take this Q and you move it say, so that, say, its center, instead of being in the upper left cell, goes to the upper right cell, then that's the same as if the Q from over here came into the cell that you were in originally. So the translations actually live in a torus. Okay? So whether you look at an infinite number of Qs in the plane or one Q but with the opposing faces glued, it's essentially the same problem. Now, the thing though is, rigid body motions in the plane forms a group. You can say G1 times G2 times G3 and it's associative and everything. Here, it's not associative. Okay, so if you go uh, one rigid body motion, such as the one in the upper left picture, that's fine. Uh, but if your center goes into the next cell, then you have to mod out the crystallographic symmetry. Okay? Which I'm just talking right here about is the translation, which would be called P1 symmetry. But there can be more complicated symmetries that involve rotations also. In fact, there are uh, 65 different crystallographic space groups uh, that correspond to proper uh, or chiral rigid body motions that can appear in uh, X-ray crystallography of biomolecules. Uh, so uh, the point is, uh, this is no longer a group uh, because we lack associativity because that modding out process, if you then multiply that result times another rigid body motion and mod that out, that's not the same as if you take the two original rigid body motions, multiply them, and mod out the crystallographic symmetry. Uh, and moreover, when you invert, so the middle picture is showing the inverse of the motion on the, on the left, uh, and it's showing actually that the center of the Q is not in the same cell that it started in. So the modding out process that brings that into the right uh, unit cell uh, is not closed. So we don't have closure under inversion and we don't have the associative property. So uh, we don't have a group anymore, but we do have something called a quasi-group uh, and that's what this paper was about, the quasi-group properties of rigid body motions. And the reason why that's important is because in the X-ray crystallography experiment where we get this diffraction pattern, uh, what that ends up telling us uh, so this right here is the diffraction pattern. This p hat is the um, is the intensity factors or the Fourier transform of something called the Patterson function. What that tells us is, uh, with the X-ray crystallography experiment, is telling us the magnitude of the classical Fourier transform of the contents of that unit cell. So that unit cell can be expanded. The the, the density in that unit cell can be expanded in a Fourier series, because we're on a torus. Uh, and, uh, but it's not the Fourier series of the density that we want. It's the Fourier series of the density that we want, and all of its the symmetry-related copies of that density, 
uh, all wrapped up, and then take the magnitude of that, of that Fourier transform. And as engineers know, you can't reconstruct the Fourier transform just from the magnitude of the Fourier transform. Uh, the, uh, you, you need the phase also. And so phasing uh, can be done either experimentally by engineering in variant variations in the protein and looking at differences. And, but one computational way for uh, phasing is called the molecular replacement method, which is to say, if I am looking for the structure of a protein and I know that it has some similarity to an existing protein, I can take that existing protein and I know the shape of my unit cell and I can do a search of how uh, the positions and orientations of this known protein can fit in this unit cell and I can construct an artificial diffraction pattern and match that with the one that I've measured experimentally. And then I can use my model to phase the protein. So in other words, um, we need to do a search over positions and orientations in this quasi-group in order to phase the experimental data. And so, um, just a little bit more math. So if rho is the function that I actually want, the rho of x, uh, what uh, the periodic version subject to the symmetry group, uh, capital gamma, is uh, <coughs> copies of this density uh, shifted by all of these symmetry group uh, elements. And what we want is to compare our model with the uh, experimental diffraction pattern. And if we can find this quasi-group element, which I'm calling G bracket sub R, which is not a Lie bracket, it's a, an equivalence class, basically. Uh, elements of an equ uh, equivalence class, this coset uh, uh, gamma uh, dividing capital G, um, that if we can find this uh, G bracket sub R, then we can essentially have a model to phase uh, the experimental data. And uh, in this other paper, we, I talked all about the properties of this quasi-group operation and defined a quasi-group action, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but we don't need to get into that. Um, now we can do some pretty pictures, and uh, another uh, method that uh, we're using to phase x-ray uh, data is a, a morphing method. So we actually developed these morphing methods long before uh, our group was interested in x-ray crystallography. The idea of morphing is if you have two structures uh, and you know the xyz coordinates of both structures, how do you generate a pathway between them? to visualize functional motions uh, and, and gain some understanding of the structure-motion relationship uh, and, and, and its uh, relationship to, to function. Um, but more recently what we've done is taken these, uh, these uh, morphing models and applied it to the phasing problem. So, but the phasing problem is much more difficult because you might have an initial phasing model, so you know all of the XYZ coordinates of one conformation, but in the other one you don't know anything except the X-ray diffraction pattern. So the question is, how do you take this and morph it so that it becomes consistent with the diffraction pattern? And that's what we've been working on. And so basically uh, we can find um, the orient from the X-ray diffraction pattern we can find relative orientations between uh, domains, these rigid body parts of the protein molecule, and we can use that to drive a morphing process, and this is showing uh, one example where the initial protein is morphed into a protein that can be used as a phasing model for the x-ray uh, data. And here's another example, um, and then here's a, here's a third example. So these are all articulated rigid body models, so they're much like uh, much like robotics problems. Uh, now, one thing about crystals is that they're very, very highly constrained environments. There's not much room to move. So another approach that we've taken, rather than just taking relative pose information and morphing, what we do is we develop packing models. Okay, so we call this the rabbit model. This, my student Yan Yan has uh, developed this. So this is uh, you know, you have the face of the rabbit, and this particular rabbit 
the eyes look like you know Lucy in the Sky on Diamonds. It's like uh, the, the tricks uh, are for kids rabbit on drugs or something. But uh, in any case, um, we take the, uh, the rabbit model, which is an articulated model, the face and the two ears, uh, and uh, here's how it goes. So we enumerate all the different ways that this, these rabbits can pack in a unit cell and without colliding with its symmetry mates. And then for all of those different ways that it can pack, we, um, uh, we generate the Fourier transform, generate the magnitude, and compare with a baseline, which we're saying is our true measurement. And so it turns out that the amount of room to move in this crystallographic environment is so constrained that just by looking at the packing model on its own, we can winnow down the number of possible uh, conformations very radically. And so this is showing how the relationship between a spatial rabbit model and a real protein, right? So many proteins have a, a main body and, and possible other domains. Um, and uh, um, this is the 3D version. And so uh, in 3D, we've been looking at these packing models. If you have the ears each having uh, its degrees of freedom and the main body having its degrees of freedom. How can you pack these models without having collisions? And this is showing the case where there is collisions. The yellow represents uh, one of these uh, models colliding with its symmetry mates in the, in the yellow region. So we, we want to do an optimization procedure, which is a stochastic optimization to reduce the amount of overlap uh, and uh, thereby generating a list of collision-free um, conformations uh, to phase um, data, to phase protein data. And so here's uh, some of these uh, papers which are uh, related to the phasing problem and X-ray crystallography. So um, now I'm going to get back a little bit to robotics. One of the uh, main things I'm doing in robotics these days uh, is not snake-like robots so much but rather combining information theory with observables in rigid body motion. Um, and that's what the topic of my new book is, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but let me give you a few examples. So a few years back, uh, my former student, uh, David Stein, uh, and my colleague, Ed Scheinerman, in the Applied Math Department, we came up with a, a spherical uh, encoder. Okay? Uh, and so, and this is an example of what I call information in motion. So we designed a spherical motor, which has uh, stator elements that have uh, icosahedral symmetry uh, and a rotor element that have octahedral symmetry. Uh, and of course, when you design a stepper motor, you don't want the rotor and the stator to have exactly the same symmetry or you get locked. Uh, so the number of teeth in the stator and the number of teeth in the rotor are typically different from each other. And this is the 3D analog of that, the difference being that uh, you, in the planar case you can divide however you like, you know, you have C sub N symmetry, whereas in the 3D case you're constrained by the symmetries of the, icosahe, of the um, uh, platonic solids, uh, and there's only three choices there. You have tetrahedral, cubic, and icosahedral, that's it. Um, and, uh, and so, in addition to the motor, we came up with an encoder. So we painted the surface of this rotor in flat black paint and in glossy white paint. And we had uh, sensors embedded in the stator. Yes? Uh, how big are these uh, motors that you showed? This motor was constrained by the size of a globe that I could purchase from the Cram Globe Company. So it's approximately one foot in diameter. Uh, and this was actually not a funded project. This was just out of... Fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, so uh, we built it, we got it to work, um, and the, 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 the relationship with information and motion here is how to encode that 3D rotation of the, of the rotor. And so we had, in the, in the stator, we had these sensors that measure black and white. The ball was painted in black and white. And we could turn the ball to any orientation. We would get a, a stream of bits of ones and zeros corresponding to black and white. 
we had an internal computer model of the painting, and so we could have an internal model of how changing the orientation would change the bit sequence, and we could do a gradient descent, in this case a non-smooth gradient descent, over the group of rotations to lock in the computer model to the observation. Uh, and so this plot at the bottom shows the rough landscape with the global minimum corresponding to the true orientation of the ball. Uh, and so some applications like, you know, would be a three-dimensional joint for robot arms or omnidirectional cameras or uh, omnidirectional wheels for vehicles, which I mentioned they had that in the movie I, Robot, but we came up with it first, if, for those of you who saw that movie. We published this paper in 1999, actually. Um, and uh, on the right is uh, having many ball-like actuators, say on a factory setting, to position and orient to, to roll um, uh, work pieces from one location to another. A problem that's very, very similar to this problem is one that arises in medical imaging except instead of pure rotations, this is, involves full six degrees of freedom of rigid body motion. So here, uh, what's shown at the top is called a stereotactic head frame. And in a stereotactic head frame, it's basically a cage that's put around a patient's head when they go in for either a CT or MRI scan. And the reason for it, number one, is to keep the person's head still, but a second reason for it, for example, if it's for a child, they may move around during the scan. And so if they move and the scan is taken at an angle, then the pattern of dots that you get from the intersection of the imaging plane and the poles in the head frame, that information can tell you how to orient the image planes in a 3D image block. Because otherwise, you know, you're going to get like a, like a Picasso kind of painting version of the person's head when you take the, uh, take the uh, image. And so we developed a method for 3D registration of the image planes based on the pattern of dots, and that too involves a gradient descent uh, uh, minimization procedure, uh, which, but that's over the, uh, the group of rigid body motions rather than the rotation group, but it's the same procedure, and that was uh, in papers three and four that are listed here. The original encoder paper is uh, listed at the bottom, and the top two are, are my new, well, the top one is the new book, and the bottom one is the, uh, the older book. Uh, I'm, we're also interested in uh, applying, again, the union of information theory and Lie groups to robotics, and so, much like the stochastic kinematic needle that we talked about before, if you have a simple kinematic cart moving in the plane, and you tell it to go straight forward, but if the wheels slip, or if there's jitter on the motors, and you're doing this open loop, instead of going straight, some of the time you'll veer a little bit this way, some of the time you'll veer a little bit that way, and if you imagine a thought experiment with an ensemble of a gazillion sample pads, what you will get is a crescent-shaped distribution at the end. And the people who do work on simultaneous localization and mapping know this very well. It's called the banana-shaped distribution. Uh, if you look at, for example, the, the book by Thrun and, and, and Bogart and, and, and those folks, the probabilistic robotics, well, their, their banana-shaped distribution is the same as my workspace density. Okay. Um, and, and here, time being the parameter rather than arc length being the parameter. There's no snake robot arm here, but it's the same kind of density. And so, uh, if we imagine that phi1 and phi2 are the, the angles of the wheels along the wheel axle, if omega of t is the deterministic forward speed that you want to go, and you superimpose on there a little bit of white noise, then you get a stochastic differential equation that describes the, uh, the evolution of the x, y, and theta of the robot. Corresponding to any stochastic differential equation is a Fokker-Planck equation that describes the evolution of probability density. This is like my DNA Fokker-Planck equation, but in the planar case. And we can solve it using the same sorts of methods. Um, and, but rather than going into the details of that, 
uh, sort of the punchline of this part, and I am almost done, so I think I'm doing okay with the 80 slides in 50 minutes, uh, uh, is that we can extend concepts from information theory to the case where you have data not on Euclidean space, so observations not like range finding and those range finding uh, uh, values depend on the position and orientation of the robot in a, in a given environment. We can extend concepts from information theory such as entropy and kobach leibler divergence to the case where we have probability densities on Lie groups such as rigid body motion in the plane. And we can extend certain information theoretic inequalities such as if I give you two probability densities and I convolve them together and I get something that's more smeared and more blurry, it has higher entropy than the original two probability densities. Or the data processing inequality, if I give you two, two probability densities and I compare them by KL divergence, then uh, they're going to be different from each other more than the two smeared versions, okay, the two convolved versions. So um, this is just a, uh, these are just a couple of many uh, information theoretic inequalities that we've extended uh, from the Euclidean setting to the Lie group setting that I think are, are going to have uh, many applications in robotics. And here's one application. So, something that I've been interested in for a while is, uh, which I haven't talked about here, is robotic self-diagnosis, self-repair, and self-replication. How do we design robots, teams of robots, that in which the team members can diagnose individual members of the team and if they find something wrong they go in and fix it. Okay, So instead of the, the normal paradigm in, in robotics which is well the robot is broken just leave it and move on. Uh, here the idea is you know they can actually go in and fix members of the team. Uh, so it works like this. So each robot here formulates an opinion about the state of say a robot that they're diagnosing. So the robot in the middle is being diagnosing, the, the other ones are saying please do a little bumblebee dance and we'll diagnose you and then based on the information we'll come and we'll, we'll fi figure out what's wrong with you and fix you if you can be fixed and if not we'll cannibalize you for parts. Uh, and then here, uh, here is another example where the robots are not necessarily fixing each other but fixing the environment on which they live. Uh, in this case, it happens to be a, a, a ship, a, a United States destroyer, how about that? <laughs> um, and uh, so here are some uh, references. Uh, again, uh, so the first one is a paper we wrote a few years ago, a collaboration with, uh, between uh, my group, my student Michael Kutzer, as well as some folks at the Applied Physics Laboratory on multi-robot uh, diagnosis. The second is, reference is, is one where I extended many uh, of these inequalities from information theory to the Lie group setting, and then the others have to do with uh, state estimation and robotic repair uh, and things of this sort. Um, so to summarize then, uh, we do a lot of different things in my lab, uh, including snake robots, spherical motors, uh, I didn't talk too much about the modular self-reconfigurable robots or self-replicating robots, but I can show some videos as, uh, as there are questions. Uh, and then we do a lot with applied mathematics, uh, applied to a wide variety of areas, including structural bio biology, both modeling, say, DNA motions, as well as uh, modeling the process of data acquisition in structural biology and uh, filtering or interpreting that data to obtain structure and motion information. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions and show some videos in the process. Are there any questions? Please. So what's the status of your needle steering things right now I mean, compared to people who are trying to put more degrees of freedom in in the needle steering by, you know, the particular adapter to Pierre Dupont and company's work. Um, so Pierre is not so much doing needle steering per se as, uh, uh, I'll let this video run in the background. This is a remote controlled self-replicating robot in the mechatronics class where there are five elements of the robot 
and the robot is uh, assembling those five elements into a copy. Of course, the robot isn't doing it, the person is doing the remote control, but still you get a, a sense for the mechanics involved in robotic self-replication. So, with that as a distraction, I will answer your hard question. <laughs> so, um, Pierre, uh, as well as Bob Webster and Noah Cowan, and myself, in fact, we, we uh, uh, have worked on something called active cannulas, which are tubes within tubes, concentric tubes pre-bent in different shapes. Um, and to my knowledge, Pierre is not doing the needle steering per se, but more this concentric tube idea. Um, and that has some benefits in that uh, by pre-designing the shape and material properties of the tubes, by inserting one relative to the other and twisting one relative to the other, you can cause the resulting tube to articulate in, in a desired way. Um, and so that's a, a different approach. It's, I'm not advocating one or the other. As I said, we've published papers on both, um, and uh, although I didn't talk about it here, um, and uh, you know, they, they both have their benefits and their drawbacks. So, so that's what I wanted to hear. So, I mean, I misspoke when I said here in the medium. Seeing, I'm saying compared to that idea versus a purely uh, you know, needle with a bevel tip, I mean, what are the pros and cons of those two approaches? So the needle with the bevel tip is very thin, uh, and so it causes much less uh, damage going in. Uh, the, uh, the concentric tube is much thicker uh, and would be better for an open environment. You would not want to stretch a big hole in, into the patient as you're using that. So if you have an open environment but still minimally invasive, uh, you know, you can use that and it can be cleaned very easily because it's just a tube. There's no nooks and crannies for stuff to get in and, and uh, causing st sterilization problems. Um, so the, the needle, I would say, would be good for if you want to reach the back side of the liver, which is hard to get to. The, uh, the, uh, the active cannula, the applications are more for like nasal and brain, where, uh, well, the brain case you have to drill a hole to get in, but uh, in both cases, uh, the idea is to sort of just sort of move around uh, in where there's natural space to move, whether it's the convolutions or whether it's the the nasal cavity. So that would be the distinction between those two. So needle, you know, you couldn't get an active cannula to the back side of the liver without cutting a lot, but you can with the needle. So, uh, I'll show this video again. This is my student Matt Moses, who graduated this last summer. His PhD was on a uh, essentially a desktop XYZ platform made out of these little modules that he himself mold, he casts them uh, into using uh, a polymeric material um, and uh, the robot is made out of these parts and here we see the robot assembling three of those parts into a stack and so uh, his PA, and this was from 2008, in the last three years he made a lot of progress, I don't have the more recent video here though where uh, his whole setup involved a robot made out of 150 of these parts and he picks them up from a palletized platform and picks in places and makes a functional copy of that robot in about a thousand uh, assembly operations. And so that's what we call a self-replicating robot. It's making a copy of itself from fundamental or basic parts. So, I don't know if there are any other questions. So how does the blood, uh, you know, how does that basically come as just a different variation? the needle steering part, how are you going to, so actually when you're punching something, so uh, how do you have a model of, you know, the flow of the blood during the time? So in the work that we've done, it's all been in phantom uh, tissues, which are essentially gelatin, uh, and the more clinical side of the effort is uh, is going on uh, without me, basically. So <laughs> my uh, modeling side was sort of early on, and then it's transitioned from uh, gelatin to uh, cadavers, well, gelatin to uh, liver that they bought from the supermarket to uh, cadavers to live dogs. And I, I, you know, once it went from gelatin, I was, you know, I was gone. That was that, that was where uh, my contributions came in. So 
how does you know so once uh, so the mathematical framework that's represented based upon the mathematics once you know you start having the complex interactions of the needle and the tissue. Mm -hmm. How well the mathematical framework extends to it when you're going to start having heterogeneity and friction and other things. So, the friction I think is okay. The heterogeneity and you know, like punching through membranes and stuff like that is not accounted for. Moreover, what's not accounted for is that any deformation of the tissue. Here, the assumption is that the tissue is firm enough that and the needle is flexible enough that it just glides through. Um, that is actually part of a modeling effort that I am still engaged in, is the coupling between the strain energy in the tissue and that of the needle to come to an equilibrium needle shape. And the current equilibrium needle shape will influence where the needle can go next. And then that's a new equilibrium. And so there's a mechanics problem there, even without heterogeneities uh, that has not been solved yet. So there's, there are opportun opportunities for the future. So the bell dip influence? I mean, the shape of the bell dip on the geometry here? Uh, sure, there's different uh, steepnesses, uh, but, um, you know, Essentially, the needle is given in advance, and uh, I mean the, the manufacturers <coughs> make it in a certain way, um, and so these all there are all, all kinds of effects. I mean, Allison and her group looked at cutting mechanics and and the, that needle effect, yeah, and that would influence, for example, in the model here, the simple model, there was a curvature kappa that has to be adjusted in some way based on the needle characteristics, both the, uh, the, the flexibility of it and the, the needle uh, bevel angle. Any questions? Just thank you once